بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين My dear brothers and sisters, Muslims today living in the West have to make strong efforts to increase interfaith dialogue with people of different faiths and religions. We see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam when he states, قُلْ يَا أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالُوا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ That, O oh people of the book, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, directs toward the Holy Prophet by stating, قُلْ Say, O Prophet, O people of the book, let us come toward a common word between one another. Let us engage in dialogue with one another, speaking on our commonalities. Thus we see that interfaith dialogue is something that is founded within the whole Qur'an. It is something that is founded during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet as it also occurred during the lifetime of the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. We need to also carry upon this tradition in terms of living, harmon- living a life of harmony with people of different faiths and different backgrounds and different traditions. We see that, for instance, the Muslims, the Jewish community, the Christian community, they all share many different similarities. The fact that we all revere and honor Prophet Ibrahim salam, that oftentimes we see that in Western circles that these three faiths are known as the Abrahamic religions because they all trace their roots back to Prophet Ibrahim salam, who sacrificed a great deal for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who submitted toward him, and we all oftentimes narrate different anecdotes about his life. Yes, absolutely, we see that there are certain differences in terms of theology, in terms of jurisprudence between the three major religions. Yet at the same time, we also see that there are a lot of similarities in the fact that we all believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fact that we all believe and hold close to us a large majority of the same themes and values which we honor amongst our own communities. We see that, for instance, Judaism is a religion that is very strict in terms of its jurisprudence. It's presented an outlook in terms of these laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has offered toward them are means to get closer to Allah. Similarly, the Islamic Sharia, very similar in the fact that we state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents these laws toward us in order to channel our individual and communal progression closer toward Him. In the religion of Christianity, for instance, we see that there is a great emphasis on the aspect of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the aspect of doing good, on the aspect of charitable efforts. Yet we find that within the religion of Islam, we see a fusion between the two. There is a balance between law and jurisprudence, and at the same time, etiquette and love and worship and spirituality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see that when the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam presents his religion toward the people of Mecca and toward the people of Medina within the Arabian Peninsula, he comes and he presents that particular vision toward them. In the early years in Mecca, he spoke about actions of belief. He spoke about theology, spoke about the belief in one God, spoke about aspects of charity and of love and of obedience and of submission. But when the Holy Prophet and the Muslims, the early Muslims, migrate toward the holy city of Medina, he begins by increasing the laws and regulations and rules upon the community so that it would become a society that is founded in terms of finding a balance, in terms of pushing and progressing closer to Allah subhanahu wa and when the Prophet ﷺ preaches by means of this, we see that in the midst of his preachings, in the midst of the verses of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, there are a large number of anecdotes of the previous prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prophets of Bani Israel, Jesus salam, and the idea that he was trying to bring the Jewish community and the Christian community closer toward understanding the religion of Islam and demonstrating toward them that he is the final prophet and he continues the legacy of Noah and of Abraham and of Moses and of Jesus and all of the hundred thousand some odd prophets that preceded his holiness Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And specifically today, we have an extremely important responsibility For instance, to project the vision of Isa toward all non-Muslims. Demonstrate that the religion of Islam reveres and honors Prophet Jesus Isa and reveres him and honors him not only, but also honors his mother Mary 
alayhi salam. As we know, the chapter 19 in the Holy Quran is dedicated to her name and toward her family. We see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions several different anecdotes about Christians and, their, and the Christian community within the Holy Quran. Today we see that Christian denominations are upwards of 30,000 and they're founded in every part of the world. And many Muslims who live in the West, or probably all Muslims who live in the West, they have either worked with them, spoken to them, gone to school with them, made friends with them, been, in, been and engaged in dialogue with the Christian community. We have to make sure that we understand the perspective of the religion of Islam when it comes to Jesus alayhi salam and the idea that we can project our narrative toward them and see what common grounds we can find in terms of furthering and increasing our dialogue and furthering and increasing our discussion. We see that number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I said before, mentions the Christian community several times within the whole Quran. We see, for instance, in chapter 36 of the, of the Holy Quran, which many of us recite on a weekly basis, at least, Surah Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about a Christian community. He narrates the story of a man by the name of Habib ibn Najjar. Habib ibn Najjar is from where? He is from a city known as Antioch in northern Syria, known as Antakya today. We see that Habib ibn Najjar, he comes toward his community and tells these individuals to follow the messengers that have come to this community in order, to, in order that they follow the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the religion of the Prophet that they're living under. The question is, who are those messengers that came to the city of Antioch, number one? And number two, which Prophet do these representatives, do these um, messengers represent? We see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Mufassirin of the Holy Quran, they state that there were three messengers sent toward the city of Antioch. These messengers are known as Simon, John, and eventually Paul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, إِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ مُثْنَيْنْ فَكَذَّبُوهُمَا فَأَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثٍ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ Initially, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders Isa alayhi salam to send toward the city of Antioch two of his successors. One of those is a man by the name of Simon, and the other one is a man by the name of John. فَأَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثٍ That they, re they rejected them, and they state, we don't want to hear what you have to say. In the same way that the Holy Prophet would send Amir al-Mu'mineen, would send other companions toward communities to go and preach the religion of Islam, he will reject it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs Isa to also send a third by the man of, by, by, by the, a man by the name of Paul. These are all amongst the disciples of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Yeah, we find that Habib bin Najjar, after they rejected these messengers of Isa alayhi salam, he comes toward that community of his and says, make sure that you follow the instructions of what these people are saying. But we find that they rejected him and eventually they killed him in a very gruesome way. We speak about one example of the community of Christians within the whole of Quran. Secondly, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, for instance, Ashab al-Kahf in Surah al-Kahf of the whole of Quran. Those Ashab al-Kahf, those people, they were migrating away from their community because of the tyr tyrannical king during that time who did not give them the ability to practice their religion freely. What religion were they? They were followers of Isa salam. They were Muslims and the fact that they followed the, their prophet, prophet Jesus alayhi salam. We see that furthermore in the whole of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Ashab al-Ukhdud for instance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we mentioned before, he narrates the story of Isa and Maryam alayhi salam within chapter 19 of the whole of Quran. But when we want to take a look and understand the perspective or the Islamic perspective of Jesus alayhi salam within the whole of Quran and within the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt, we see that we could take it threefold. There is a theological understanding of Isa. There is, for instance, a spiritual understanding of Isa. And thirdly, there is an eschatological role of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Let us take a look at each and every one of these very, very briefly. Number one, we see that the theological view is very similar to that in terms of the reverence that we have for all of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the station of Jesus alayhi salam is unique from a lot of the other prophets. From the fact that he is known as the Ulul Adham. He is amongst the greatest prophets in the religion of Islam, along with Noah, along with Ibrahim, along with Musa, and along with Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we see that within our narrations, the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt, there are several different anecdotes about his life. 
For instance, we see on one occasion that Isa is speaking with his Hawariyun, the disciples, and he's telling them that I have been gifted the ability to cure the leper. I have been gifted the ability, for instance, to um, cure the individual who is paralyzed. But there's one group of people that I have no way that I'm able to cure them. It is said that at this moment, his disciples, they say, Oh, our Master Isa, tell us, you have been able to perform all of these different types of miracles. What is that group of people that you're unable to cure? Isa alayhi salam, I'm unable to cure the fool. They say, Oh, Rasulullah, oh, 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 Allah, who is the fool? At this moment, Jesus, he responds by stating, The fool is the one who doesn't take consultation and demonstrates arrogance by only following his own opinion. Thus, we find that we can find a large number of different, of different ethical and moral anecdotes from the life of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. And in the Islamic perspective, theologically, of course, we believe that Jesus alayhi salam is a prophet. He is a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who comes down with the Injil. He comes down with the Gospels as it is often translated. And though he is not God nor the Son of God, we see that even then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored him, as we mentioned, by the fact that he has attained certain spiritual gifts. We see, for instance, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the fact that Isa alayhi salam has had the ability to speak while he was in the cradle. قَالَ إِنِّي أَبْدُ اللَّهِ آتَانِي الْكِتَابِ وَجَعَلَنِي نَبِيَّ When Mary was pregnant with Isa alayhi salam, and she began to feel the pangs of, and the pangs and the pains of childbirth in those final moments before she gave birth to her son, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously transports her from the city of Bethlehem toward a city on the outskirts of the holy city of Kufa. And according to some narrations of the Ahlul Bayt, that Isa alayhi salam is born in the holy city of Karbala, parallels with Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. We see that when he was born, of course, Mary was very startled and wondered exactly how she's going to go back toward her community. But at that moment, Isa alayhi salam, her son who was just a child, consoled her and said, do not speak. When they enter back into the city of Bethlehem and all of the community of uh, the family members and the entire community, they come and they see Mary, Maryam alayhi salam with a child. They go toward her and they state, how could it be that you have a child and so on and so forth. And they begin to make certain claims, uh, immoral claims against her. Mary, she points toward her son Isa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes the verse, قَالَ إِنِّي عَبْدُ اللَّهِ الْكِتَابِ while he was just a child, while he was just days old, he states that I am a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Abdullah. Atani al kitab Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me a book and made me into a prophet in order to demonstrate the miracle of the birth of Isa alayhi salam and the glory of the mother of Jesus alayhi salam in terms of Mary. We come forth and we see that according to different narrations that Isa alayhi salam is born on the 25th of the Al-Qa'da, a Tuesday. And we come and we see that of course we reject many of these different narrations that state that Isa alayhi salatu wasalam had been killed, but rather we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran. Thus, when we want to take a look at the theological stance of the religion of Islam about Prophet Isa, he is revered, he is honored, known as amongst the Ulul Adam, and performed miracles even from when he was a very young child. Secondly, we take a look at the spiritual role of Prophet Jesus والسلام, in the religion of Islam. We state that all of the, the infallibles, by means of the 14 infallibles, the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, they have a human dimension, but at the same time they have what is known as a spiritual dimension. The human dimension being known as what? The fact that they're able to converse with one another, they're able to lead us, they have similarities with the human being, but they also have a spiritual dimension. The fact that they have this intense insight and knowledge, the ability to perform ilm al ghaib for instance, have the knowledge of the unseen, to have this type of foresight. We see that in Christian theological circles, as we mentioned, there are upwards of 30,000 different theological circles within Christianity. Not all of them believe that Jesus السلام, was able to perform some of these spiritual miracles that even the religion of Islam accepts, for instance. We see, for instance, that there are a group of Christians who state that Isa السلام, it's just a metaphor when, it, when we state that he's walking on water. In the religion of Islam, we state, no, 
that Isa السلام, has been honored toward the greatest of heights, the greatest of spiritual heights, where he has been gifted the gift of what is known as wilaya, wilaya to taqwiniyyah. Due to the permission that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him, he has the ability to bring the dead back to life. He has the ability to cure the leper. He has the ability to cure the paralyzed and the blind and the deaf and the dumb. This is of course out of the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but this gift is only given to those who have reached the highest level in terms of proximity and in terms of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thirdly, whenever we're speaking about Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, especially to non-Muslims, to especially in regards to our Christian brothers in humanity, we come and we see that we have to demonstrate toward them, especially us as followers of the Ahlul Bayt, that Isa السلام, has an eschatological role, a responsibility at the end of times, according to narrations. Of course, we know that the Christians believe that he has a messianic role in terms of coming back to the world and saving it and removing it from injustice and oppression. But so do the Muslims. We also believe that Isa السلام, is going to come and be at the support of Imam al-Mahdi, Imam al-Zaman, the 12th Imam, the progeny of the Ahl al-Bayt, and he will present toward them the ideology of the Holy Prophet and offer different avenues of support to the Imam والسلام, to create a government and a society and a community of peace and tranquility. And we see that according to different narrations, Isa والسلام, will be the avenue to bring the religion of, and, 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 and the faiths of others with the faith of Imam al-Zaman and have everyone united under his banner. My dear brothers and sisters, as we mentioned, the verse of the Holy Quran in the beginning, which I mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he instructs the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to engage in this type of dialogue, in this type of discussion with the Ahlul Kitab, with the people of the book. Qul ya Ahlul Kitab, ta'alu ila kalimatin sawa in baynana wa baynakum. That come to a common word with one another. If we made certain strides within our life to present toward Christian community and the Jewish community and other faiths about the similarities we have, we see that differences and the barriers will fall down and we'll be able to create bridges for discussion, for dialogue and avenues perhaps to present toward them the perspective and the narrative of the Holy Quran, the teachings of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt If we make these certain strides to present toward them the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, perhaps there's an avenue for them, a door for them to enter into understanding the greatness and the glory of Rasulullah, the greatness and the glory of Ali ibn Abi Talib We have to strive, make our very best efforts to increase in dialogue, but at the same time, increase our knowledge of those specific figures which they might hold in reverence, an example of those being Jesus, Isa ibn Maryam we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will become amongst those individuals who will have the opportunity to increase such dialogue, who have the opportunity to engage others of different faiths. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wasallallahumma ala Sayyidina wa Nabiina Muhammad wa ala hatayyibin at-tahirin.